All right. Well, let's let's see. It's twelve oh four now, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alex Tarantino. I'm PDI's Kent County Vice President and Chair of the Education Committee. Um, so we want to welcome you to the first installment um, in our Historic Preservation Webinar Series. So today we have Laura Blau, who's a principal at Blue Path Design, to present on historic preservation and sustainability and her work with historic retrofits in the age of climate change. So before I introduce Laura, just wanted to give um, our attendees a few reminders today. So you all are muted um, and don't have video. So if you do have a question, um, we'll ask that you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll be keeping track of those questions throughout the presentation and we'll have time afterwards to answer those. Um, you can also use the chat box at the bottom to get in touch with us if you're having any issues or technical difficulties or have other types of questions. So this workshop, um, like our other webinars, is being recorded. Um, so this will be available in a few weeks on our YouTube channel. And after the webinar, we're going to have a short survey that you'll get. So if you could take a minute and fill that out, that would be really helpful to us. And lastly, if you aren't already a member of PDI, we do encourage you to consider joining or donating. Your support helps keeps, keep events like this one free. So we'll post more info um, about our YouTube channel, our website um, in the chat for you. So today our presenter is Laura Blau. Laura has over 25 years experience in architectural design and construction and is an award-winning fine arts painter and sculptor. Her architectural work reflects her sensitivity to aesthetics and craft. Her commitment to sustainable design and science-based conservation-first approaches to low-carbon design is underscored by her certification as LEED BD and C, Certified Passive House Consultant and Passive House Builder. She brings her expertise in design and constructability to every aspect of her work. She's a regular speaker at major conferences on passive house and sustainable design at such venues as Green Build 2013, IFMA World Workplace 2013, AIA Architectural Exchange 2014, and EEBA BA Expo 2015. She's taught architectural design as an adjunct professor for the Tyler School of Arts Architecture Program at Temple University and Philadelphia University School of Architecture and Design. In addition, she has also served on numerous area university juries, think tanks, and advocacy groups. So welcome, Laura. Thanks so much for joining us. We're really excited to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Um, I just want one clarification. I have not maintained my lead certification. I was for a while. Um, I primarily focus, um, I've used the checklist, absolutely, it's excellent. Um, but I primarily work as the passive house consultant in, in my approaches, and that's the certification that I uh, um, am maintaining now. Okay, thanks. So, um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen. And all right, so hello, everyone. All right, so a new paradigm shift for historic retrofits in the age of climate change, or a little more controversial. Oops, where it happened to my clicker? Where's my? Mm, I just lost my. Uh, Okay, what happened to my advance? It was here before. All right, I guess I'm gonna to have to do it this way. Okay, or the existential and uh, ethical challenges of preservation in the time of climate change. Oh, because Laura, this... just real quick, just I don't think the slide advanced on, on my end. All right, so what did we do differently that is not working at the moment? Um, Let's see, maybe try um, stopping sharing and then starting again. But the advance buttons were down here and now they're not. I'm sorry, we thought we had this all together, but my buttons were down here and they're not there. 
Um, no worries. It wouldn't be Zoom without <laughs> it be Zoom without without this. We practiced and then <laughs> here we are. Um, let's see. Stop share. Okay. Okay, so all right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so um, in in the history of uh, the most recent history of um, preservation, when it comes to the environment, um, it's been seen as being sort of equal. Um, that you know, preservation and uh, uh, energy efficiency and sustainability are sort of on equal paths. And oops. Did you just... do you see the screen change? No, not yet. I still just see ah. right now. So... We see all of PowerPoint. Huh. So if you try down at the, the bottom right screen um, near where the, the Zoom uh, bar is, the button right to, oh, there we go, just popped up. Okay. So I see the slide with the, um, the ballot Good. preservation. Now the question is how climate. to advance them. There we go. Yep, it's advanced. Okay, now. good. All right. So we have seen this as being equal, but in fact, they are not equal. Uh, the climate change mitigation is so much more threat to human culture and society and existence uh, than the wonderful goals of preservation that we really have to think differently about how we approach uh, remediations, etc. So we have to adjust that fulcrum and we have to think about how to have a properly balanced system um, where we think about how and what is important about our historic buildings, how we can preserve and save them, and <laughs> not to, yeah, to, to, and to be a part of the mitigation of global climate change. So um, this is, has to do with learning about the science of buildings and how it is, has, has been in the past and how is it's changing because of climate. So that we're gonna use the example of our own four unit um, apartment building in Philadelphia. I'm sitting in it right now um, in the first floor unit in that where those posters are and that air conditioner unit used to sit in that window. <laughs> That's where I'm sitting right now. Um, and this is, um, a, had its first renovation. This is from 1845. It's 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 an old building. Um, it had its first renovation in the 20s, which was when it was 75 years old. I purchased the building in 1997 for $220,000. I made some minor renovations and sort of um, cleaned it up a bit um, uh, and rented it out and lived in it um, for a while. Uh, and then uh, it had its we started its major renovation for a second term at 96 years after that. And we hope that we go for another 100 years, at least with what we've done. And thus, retrofits don't happen very often. And so you bake in certain things. And it's important that we bake in the right things. Um, so this is where it is. Here's up in the, the top is where uh, Rittenhouse Square is Rittenhouse Park, which is a famous, beautiful, wonderful park. And this is the Rittenhouse Historic Bittler neighborhood. And our building is right on the edge of the historic district that ends along here. Um, 
And all these buildings were built at one time. In fact, pairs of them share walls and we share wall, we're in the middle. So we share a wall with either side. This side is nice and tight. This side was pulling out. Our neighbors would not cooperate and starbolt theirs. And so we had a number of serious sort of structural things we had to do, knitting our two buildings together, both from the outside and from the inside. Uh, this is the rear. There's nothing special about this alley street. A few blocks down, there is entries onto people's, um, uh, they have front doors on this small a Waverly Street. But in our several blocks, it is just the butt ends of cars and doggy bags and trash cans. Um, so we had to present our case to the Historic Commission. And uh, obviously, uh, one of the things was that we wanted to do was to um, take that rear and uh, do an insulated rain screen system. And I'll talk to you later about the science about why that's important. Um, but 60% of the buildings back here are stuccoed. Um, and yet the Historic Commission over two rounds said, no, we couldn't cover up this brick. This is more looks at the back alley. It, it's really nothing special back here. Um, there's boarded up windows and, and, uh, um, and there's vinyl siding on my neighbor has since changed this out for vinyl siding and even shrunk their windows more with cheap, the cheapest windows you could get. Um, Passive House is a science-based approach. It's conservation first. It's about building better. It's about smart design, which is both efficient, comfortable, healthy, and has zero energy capability. This is a Passive House historic retrofit in Brooklyn. Um, and this is the, uh, the, the modeling it for energy. You can see this ultraviolet, uh, that there's no energy escaping from this house, unlike the energy leaking horribly around its neighbors. That is how efficient a passive house building can be. So why is it so important to think about passive house principles and building science when we approach this? And first of all, the issues around climate change are a matter of scale across time. Uh, we are currently in the Anthropocene age, and I, you know, hopefully you know that that means that we're in the age where human beings are the major change agents of our geography, our climate, all kinds of things, um, that we have been that impactful, that the age is named after us. I don't think this is something we should be all that proud of. <laughs> Because what we've done is disturb the balance of nature, right? Nature creates CO2, but it also uptakes CO2, plants and trees. And there's a balance that has been maintained. And because of the incredible emissions um, of carbon that we are spewing into the atmosphere and the destruction of lots of our forests and uh, rainforests and all kinds of forests, the ability to uptake that, the two combined has meant that we have tipped the balance and we're overloading CO2 so rapidly as if it has never been this rapid in, you know, in the history of the planet um, or nearly so. The scale at which we can scar the earth and, um, and, and harvest its minerals, its uh, flora and fauna, all this kind of stuff is so huge. These little trucks down here are not little. They're the size of a typical row home in Philadelphia. They are three stories tall. They're nearly 20 feet wide. And so the scale of this is the size of a city, the factory. And, and this is just like the whole environments of, of Camden and Philadelphia and its environs combined. This is a tar sands. And we've done that with scraping the bottom of the ocean for fish and cutting down trees in the Amazon and you name it. We have wreaked havoc in a way with our environment. 
Um, so how do we mitigate this? We do it through what um, Princeton University called the wedge theory, which is every one of us is a little wedge and all together we can create a larger wedge. And like with any wedge system, at first you tap, 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 and you think you're never gonna be able to lift up that stone and then you're ma managed to be able to do it. So um, buildings are one of these main wedges. And when you look at, these are not wedges, these are actually um, temperature. Uh, this, is, this is how much CO2 if we do nothing with standard construction. This is why Energy Star is not good enough. This is quote unquote considered reasonable safe zone. Uh, I don't know how safe that is, but Passive House really begins to take advantage of things, the 2080 challenge, which, which is taking things to 100 percent zero is really where we need to go to mitigate. Um, and of course, the CO2 that we've already emitted will take some 30 years uh, its impact or, or what we do today is impacting us in 30 years. So in other words, what we do today is not gonna mitigate immediately. It is the kind of thing that will um, affect our grandchildren and our children's children. Uh, and that's how important it is that we need to stop this. Um, we've had our carbon party and, um, and it's time for us to clean up the house, not leave it to the teenagers. Um, so in, a, in cities like Philadelphia, the, the greenhouse gas emissions are really in the building sector. Um, and these flip in different areas, um, but in, in cities, buildings are a major component. This is also the sea level rise and combined with severe storms and what flooding we expect to experience um, which is, you know, can be, uh, you know, over six feet in some areas. Um, so I think, you know, this is going to affect all of us. Um, we had, you know, the Schuylkill River become a canal uh, after uh, Ida. Um, so when you look at targeting things, it's important that we, we look at residential and retrofit and all buildings. So what is the preservation mission? Um, obviously it's preserving historic character, but it's also preserving the overall structure and preserving say a whole neighborhood role like our street um, and uh, making it viable for the next hundred years, which means it needs to be affordable, durable, healthy, safe, and low carbon both utilization energy and embodying. One is how much energy the building uses for heating and cooling, for lights, et cetera, um, but also what is it made of? When, we, when I approached the, um, the, the historic commission and I will show you what the science that we approached them at, we were turned down and we were allowed to come back and make another attempt we were turned down we, a second time for our covering our rear brick. Two people chased me out of the room. One uh, was an academic from Harvard who is also a preservationist and a building science person who said, oh my gosh, he said, your hydrothermic models, which you're gonna see in a minute, are exactly what we've been discovering. It's, you know, preservationists really need to learn the building science. This is so important. I said, yeah, but I just made two attempts and I failed. So. <laughs> You know, what do you do? Um, the other person was Michael Sklaroff, um, lawyer with Ballard Spar. And he said, I bet you don't know there's a thing called the Environmental Bill of Rights in the Pennsylvania Constitution. I said, no, I had no idea. Uh, and this is what it is, which it says that, you know, every, everyone in the government is a trustee of the environment to conserve and maintain it for the benefit of all people and that, you know, that for current and future generations. Um, so I also wanna remind us all that the AIA code of ethics started with just a paragraph or two about in 
environmental and energy efficiency. It now has several pages of ethical uh, codes of conduct that we need to be aware of. And it says that we need to be informed. We need to understand the science and what options there are. And we're supposed to inform our, our um, clients and we're supposed to work to implement this stuff. Um, this is my building. And this is how many wall types I have. It's quite the colored, colorful quilt. Um, so you can see that when you do a retrofit on an old building, you have a lot of different conditions. Some created with, you know, partial renovations over time, but you know, we have three wife brick and two wife brick, and we have the front brick, which is amazing, really good brick, and we have the back brick, which is really porous and awful brick. And we have a bay that is is, is wood frame. And you know, we have all these different conditions um, that changes. Some had had some walls with insulation, some are plastered directly onto the, the brick, some is plaster on lath. So you know, you have a lot of conditions to understand and consider. So when we were looking at what we needed to do, we were looking at how do we um, get to low energy with our passive house building. And we were looking like this says cork, but we will talk about why we're not going to be doing cork, but, um, but it is about exterior insulation uh, or an EVE system. First of all, you have to understand what's going on with the masonry and the various kinds of walls in, and how they perform hygrothermically. Um, in other words, how moisture and heat transfer through them. So this is a Rillam uh, test, uh, which is you put a column of water uh, that's calibrated and you fill it with water and then you time how long it takes that water to soak into the wall. First over the first 30 minutes, an hour, and then over a 24 hour period. When we did this to our front wall, which is on, on the left here, um, it hardly moved. In 24 hours, it only moved about a quarter of an inch. That is incredibly great brick. And that's a beautiful rain screen and it's doing exactly what it should do to protect a building. On the other end, on the back side, it was the crappiest brick you could get in the day. It's very porous. Um, and, uh, and you test both the, the mortar, which should be more porous than the brick. But basically, we kept on having to fill that little column up again and again and again. All right, so here's our front brick. You can see it, it doesn't move very much. And here's our rear brick. And this is the most conservative of that rear brick. So obviously, it's, there's a mix of brick, and some are a little better than others. This was one of the better. I was being conservative in how I uh, approached my data. All right. So when we do hygrothermic models and we look at this red line is the temperature change and these are the years. So this is over um, a five-year um, five period. So you can see it's summer, it's winter, it's summer, it's winter. And then, um, excuse me, and then the, um, the green is the humidity over the same period of time. This dotted line here with 80% relative humidity is our line over which we really don't want to go above, right? All walls get wet. The question is how fast and how well do they dry out? Um, so what we see is that we are getting wet and thus we can create mold in this zone, in these areas, and that's a concern. What most of you don't realize, or maybe some of you do, is that this area on the outside looks fine, right? Looks pointed, it looks okay. Uh, on the inside, however, it's cupping and it's turning to dust. So the question is, why is that happening? Well, when you take a 170 year old building and you start to air condition it and you have increasing humidity and longer and more intense rains and that wall is very porous, then that air conditioning is going to pull that moisture to the inside face of the wall where it condenses 
and start to deteriorate our wall. So they're melting from the inside out. Here's another location where the exact outside looks fine, inside not so good, All right? So this is, oh, excuse me. All right, now how do I get this to go? Here we go. All right, so you can see when I touch this brick, all the effervescence on it, and there's, there's some of it that just crumbles. All right, that's, that's what's happening to our buildings. They are crumbling around us. And if we don't appreciate that um, building science fact, then we will not be making the right decisions on how to preserve our buildings. So here is um, when we do the model, we've added insulation and a smart vapor barrier uh, on, the, on the front wall, all right? And we find that we are very happy. Our moisture is well below our, our line. When you air seal a brick wall properly, you can, double or triple the insulation depending on the climate. You have to do all these kind of checks to make sure it works. But you basically can double or triple the insulation against that brick wall. I know a lot of you have learned you can't insulate more than X number of, of inches or to R value of a certain point because you will create a self-destructing wall. That's true if you don't air seal properly. So the building science says when we air seal well, and properly, um, then we can super insulate those walls. Um, so this is the rear. And again, when we put that insulation without an exterior uh, insulation on it, we are even more, we are in danger, right? So, um, and then when we add that EFS to it, right? then we are happy again. Our humidity is below our danger line. And now if it just peaked up a little, we don't care about that. That's not long enough to create any mold or mildew problems. So this is why we need to cover that rear brick, not the front brick, right? The front brick's great. And we wouldn't want to cover it anyway. We wouldn't want to find some other ways to solve the front problem. Um, because it's historic. Uh, the back is not so special. Uh, and, um, and we believe that uh, a stucco finish or a rain screen finish of some kind um, uh, is not covering up anything that is that uh, historically special. And this is where we're gonna have some people who wanna push back. And the advantages and the benefits to human beings, to the planet, to the city, all sorts of benefits are gained from, from doing it right. Now, what the Historic Commission says is that we can't mechanically fasten uh, to that wall. And this is where I will be controversial and say, I think this is a really silly rule uh, because one, do you really think someone's gonna take that lath off or, or that uh, the, the rain screen off to, discover this wall again. There was nothing very special about it. It's cheap material. It's the back end of things. And uh, I don't think it has cultural significance. Um, it limits what we can do. Now we only can use a very light insulation. We tried uh, cork on our rear upper wall um, of the um, where the deck is, where you can't see it from the street. But the cork is just on that cusp of being too heavy um, to be appropriate for a drainage plane using a raked um, ad adhesive. Uh, so you get a drainage plane and so, but to you're gonna reduce um, the carbon of embodied energy, you don't wanna be using petroleum products for your insulation. Um, so, you know, Ultimately, we'd really like to be able to mechanically fasten and use a, a carbon sequestration product like cork, wood fiber insulation, or something 
less um, onerous than petroleum products like mineral wool boards. This is what cork looks like. We did it on our back wall. Um, it's not really appropriate, I think, to keep it uh, uh, exposed in our urban situation. Uh, you might want to do that in the country, but um, you can do an eaves right over top of this um, if you wanted. Uh, but like I said, it really needs to be mechanically fastened. It is air, it is watertight, um, and it's carbon sequestration, and it's a really interesting product. Uh, but there's always six ways to skin that cat and still be pretty environmentally sound. The other thing is to get rid of gas. We had, uh, I put these in when I first bought the building 27, 28 years ago, um, and they had gone through their useful life. We had them removed and we had the gas removed. It took many calls, um, but we had it removed completely from the building. There isn't even a nipple that comes in through that front wall anymore. So we are frack free. Like I said, we had um, to knit together right here in both sides and we use um, a, um, a, a thermal um, blocking product called Armatherm, which has the, uh, the strength of wood, uh, the PSI of wood and can be milled like wood. It comes in various PSIs. You can even get it so sturdy that it becomes um, something you can put under a, a footing of a larger building. But in any case, one of the things you have to do when you're super insulating is you have to turn the corner with the insulation. And that is because um, uh, you would create, there's a thermal bridge between our super insulated building and the not so insulated building adjacent to us. And this corner has to be mitigated through rolling that insulation around a certain number of inches and your model will tell you. You can see I've used liquid. Um, so plaster is a good air barrier and this is a liquid air barrier by Prosico MVP. Um, which is, so we used a combination depending on, you know, the condition of the wall and what we were doing, right? Um, when you get to the basement, um, we have uh, a stego wrap coming up the wall and then we attached a wrap at the uh, grade level and attached it to this. And there's a um, sump pump French drain around the perimeter of this. Um, and, uh, and then in our bay, we wood frame, we had to completely rebuild the bay because it had been, um, uh, well, it had been added to, it literally went on down to the ground and someone added a third floor to it without adding any structure or footings. And so it was sinking about six inches in this room. You could roll a chair and, and play marbles into that corner. Um, so we rebuilt it, we restructured and put, uh, structure on either side um, and um, so there is this is a smart air barrier what you see called intello when i say smart what that means is that it is um, vapor open in other words we pack cellulose back here which can become like a reservoir so it can actually bank moisture if you get a load from inside from cooking pasta and showers as well as a big heavy summer rain on the outside this cellulose can bank a certain amount of that moisture until the sun hits the wall or the air conditioning takes up the moisture from the inside then we put battens here which is where we run our mechanicals and wires through and uh, the smart air barrier means that it is vapor open and it knows the direction of the vapor drive. So it can dry to either side, which in our climate and the amount of humidity and rain and moisture that we experience in both seasons, it's real important that that wall is that dynamic that it can dry out in both directions. Uh, Moisture vapor is smaller than air molecules. Um, and so uh, it is airtight, but vapor open. Um, the other really important piece of equipment that you have when you're doing a passive house is called an energy recovery ventilator. There's also heat recovery ventilators that only exchange heat, but energy recovery ventilators for our climate 
is appropriate because it does both heat and uh, both um, latent, which is humidity, and uh, sensible temperature uh, mitigation. So basically, one of these ducts is bringing fresh air in. The other is exhausting the stale air and used air out. And it exchanges the energy in here. There's a HEPA filter uh, and a regular filter that filters the air going out and a HEPA filter that uh, filters the air uh, com coming in. Um, and it exchanges about 84, 85% of the energy, very efficient. Um, and so the heating system on the inside is taking the fresh air from inside because this is the lungs of the building that's providing beautifully filtered fresh air um, for inhabitants. And if you'll talk to anyone who's been in a passive house, your allergies are reduced when you're inside. If you have um, asthma, well, there's lots of anecdotal conversation about how, you know, my daughter only needs to use her inhaler, you know, 60% of the time she used to, or I leave it at the door because I only need my inhaler when I leave the house. Um, what are we doing here? Oh, all right. So, this is. Okay, our passive house. Let's see, is it going? All right. This is the second floor apartment. And if you remember that arch that we saw, there it is. This is that front room. This is the smaller bedroom that looks out in the south window on the areaway. We retain this, just retrimmed some of this. This is, we added this smaller bathroom, taking away a, a closet. Um, that was in that living room that wasn't very useful. And then we restored and reconfigured this bathroom with beautiful marble detailing. That window used to be a jealousy window and is now a passive house package using that armatherm uh, for a, a frame. We restored and cleaned up and rewired a lot of the fixtures. The floors, the original floor, or maybe it was from the 20s, I'm not sure which. All the windows have stone sills, so you can put plants on it. Got tired of painting those sills over the 27, 20, whatever years I've owned this building. We put this, uh, took out a small part of room and expanded the kitchen to be this large Eden kitchen. It's induction range and Energy Star equipment. There's a, um, ductless washer dryer in that closet. And we have a beautiful shared deck. On this deck uh, it has a canopy, which we will eventually put a solar array on. Uh, we don't have enough roof space to get all the way to zero for this building, but we will certainly make a big dent in the last little bit of energy we use. We have got great views of the city. You can see all the way down to the Navy Yard and into Center City. And that is what a passive house looks like. So what is the summary? As Ed Masria said when he developed the 2030 challenge, which is 60% of the world's buildings are going to be rebuilt in the next two decades. This is a huge opportunity if we do it right. It will be a missed opportunity because with the example of our building, buildings don't get touched for 25 to 75 years between renovations. We'll waste money, we'll miss opportunities. We need to leapfrog and take on this challenge because you only have one little planet and we should be humbled by that. All right, that is my presentation.
and I will take questions. I also, if anyone needs um, to have um, any of the um, uh, products that we used, I'd be happy to share that. It's actually hidden in my PowerPoint if we unhide it, um, that, that we could show that. So I'll take questions. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much. That was really interesting. There actually were, let's see, so in thinking in terms of um, products and, and a reference. So I'll start with um, somebody in the chat did ask uh, for a link to the Pennsylvania um, Environmental Bill of Rights that you mentioned. Um, what I, I sort of did a quick Google, I didn't want to interrupt you, but um, is that chapter 27 of the state constitution? I believe okay. so. Okay, so that is that is the link that um, that we posted in the chat. And then in terms of materials, so there was a question um, asking, is hempcrete or hemp wool a possibility? Yeah, you know, I, every every insulation product has its um, pros and cons, has its qualities. Um, some are, you know, like uh, um, XPS and EPS are not are airtight, so um, they are not going to be a vapor open wall. They will be a wall that has a one side block, and it needs to be vapor open at least on one side. Um, so hemp, um, wool. I mean, there's all kinds of products out there. Um, some are more appropriate for certain clients, client climates than others. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's a understand what your wall system needs to be and how you want to achieve that. But it, you have to do it all understanding how the science of all these things, how the hydrothermic dynamics of moisture and temperature move through your building. And some of that is very particular. I mean, we have um, local issues like our, our, our you know, mostly shaded uh, well. Um, we have a southern exposed back. We have a northern exposed front. I mean, all those change the moisture dynamics of, of the building. Thanks. And maybe a, a follow up or sort of related question. Um, what are your feelings on stone wool for insulation? You, you mean? Um, uh, like mineral wool? Is that what they are asking for? All right, mm -hmm. so min yeah, the mineral wool boards yes. <laughs> are a great exterior insulation that can be used under a rain screen uh, EAP system or whatever, it, that's, it's a very good product. Um, so it's, um, and, and we, we would, uh, are likely gonna be using that um, on ours. Um, uh, so yes, that's a good product. It's, it's carbon footprint is a little bigger than say wood fiber insulation. Um, but again, there's different costs and there's different qualities. So wood fiber insulation is more expensive than mineral wool bats, um, uh, boards. Um, you know, so every project has its uh, set of criteria that you need to meet and you know, you weigh them. Understood. Um, so we have a, another question. How affordable is this to a middle class homeowner and can some of this be done in stages? Absolutely. We are working in stages in this building. Our unit, which is was the full gut rehab, is um, we are we are just a hair's breadth. We have a few little minor things that we have to address um, to meet the passive house standard. The upper floors had more complicated areas. There's actually the third floor bathroom. We didn't tear the wall out and all the tile. Uh, and um, uh, that's not in the, the video that we showed. That was the second floor unit. So it was the least renovated because some renovations had been done previously. A new kitchen had been put in. So we didn't tear out the rear wall and super insulate that. So there are, you know, this is a, a phased and Enerfit, which is the international retrofit program. Enerfit is a step-by-step. -step. So again, you wanna make sure that you have building science knowledge on how to phase that because you can create building science problems if you do things in the wrong order or don't understand the building science. 
So it's a matter of master planning that and understanding we should do this first, this is better second, this could happen along the way, you know, so you could combine things. So it's, it's a process that, that is an, an analytical process. Thank you. Um, let's see, we've got a couple questions rolling in um, right now. So the next question, how will we achieve the target building emission reductions if many homes will not be updated to passive house standards and continue to use fossil fuels? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that that's a serious question. I don't have the answer to that. I don't know if we had that magic. If I had that magic answer, you know, I would certainly be a star amongst stars and um, and hopefully a well to do star. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, this is the challenge. One, there's people know well, I, I say they used to know more about what's under the hood of their car. I think now they don't even know what's under the hood of their car anymore because everything's automated. But, you know, people really do not understand how their houses work. I do a lot of expert witness work. I, I do all kinds of houses all over the region uh, where I, we do destructive testing and we see just the horrible state of construction and the epidemic of rotting buildings because both the architects and the builders do not understand that some of the new products and combinations of products, um, if you don't understand how to put them together and put them together right, you, you actually create a rapidly deteriorating building. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we need a massive amount of education um, and preservationists need to understand what this building science is because otherwise we will be seeing our buildings destroyed uh, by the very hydrothermic issues that I pointed out, masonry buildings and others. Um, but the other thing is that, um, uh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> what was I gonna say? Um, our buildings will be destroyed and, um, and, 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 well, I anyway, uh, let, let's move on. <laughs> Whatever I was going to say, I missed it. So, <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. Because I, I, I think that's the, I don't know, that is the challenge, like you said, is that it's, you know, it's a serious problem. And it sounds like it's going to take sort of a multi prong approach with kind of everybody's involvement and cooperation to get there. Well, you know, the new codes, the 2018, even the 2015 code made air sealing mandatory. It is not enforced at the level it should be. There should be a special inspection for envelopes before you cover that up so that you know that it's flashed properly, you know that it's air sealed, that it gets tested at that point when you can correct problems. Um, and, and, you know, so education is really important. And then how to detail this? I see, you know, in my expert witness work, I see architectural details. And, you know, it's like pointing to a partition type to say that you have an air barrier is not good enough because the whole point is you have to show the details of how this is continuous, how it connects at the windows, at the walls, at the corners, at the roof, you know, at the foundation. How do you make it continuous? And that's where the, 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 the rubber meets the road, as it were, that's where we need to understand and detail it correctly. And then we need to educate our construction crews because right now, generally there's a foreman, he shows up once a week, he buys a whole pile of materials and some 20 something who doesn't half the time has never even seen the drawings, much less could they read them if they saw them, um, maybe doesn't even speak the language and someone just says, Here, here's a staple gun and a, you know, and and some stuff, wrap the building with it. They don't, they aren't informed. And this is a problem because we're building too fast and too cheap. And hundreds of thousands of dollars on these houses to remediate them is just a sin. Sounds like it, yeah. Um, also, this is kind of a good a good segue. So, um, from Barbara, I guess two two points. Um, I think 
a couple of people are interested in, um, in your product list. So, um, if there's a way, if you wanted to send that to me and maybe we can send we'll it do. out to mm -hmm. attendees, I Actually, think that's probably I, one you way. Have the, you have the PowerPoint Okay. and in it near the end, after the video, you just unhide. Perfect. And there's, there's several pages of, uh, slides of information. Oh, great. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get that, that out to those interested. I think, I imagine that's probably one way is even just sort of making it more, um, you know, making it more clear to people what different products are available maybe for, for their use. But then as a follow-up to that, um, how do you think, um, you know, people can, can acquire that knowledge? You know, I, obviously I think presentations like this are, are sort of one way to do it, but um, do you have any other sort of ideas on how to best spread that information? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I'm um, a member of Green Building United. I, um, and Green Building United has the Passive House community, and we have, I'm one of the co-authors of a manual, a row house retrofit manual, um, and it's free to the public, uh, and please become a member of Green Building United, because we're a great organization, and we have a sustainability conference coming up, um, and so um, the, there's always webinars, our Passive House group is taking that manual and giving seminars um, every month on a chapter. So you can get that information. Passive House US and Passive House International have tra tradesmen and builder trainings, as well as architect, designer, consultant trainings. Um, uh, Green Building Advisor is a great website. Passive House Accelerator is a wonderful, I just did a podcast that if you look me up, it just got uh, listed on Monday. Um, and they have uh, multiple weekly, there's construction tech, there's policy seminars, there's uh, developer seminars, there's design seminars. Um, there's lots of places to learn more about the building science. And I'll tell you, if you love buildings, you can get hooked on this stuff. You become a real energy nerd, a, a building science nerd, and you start asking all these questions when you start realizing what you need. Building Science Corporation, um, Joe Stebrick is, um, is a wealth of knowledge, his organization, and they have lots of white papers. Um, so, you know, there's lots of places to get educated. Um, thank you so much. I did just post in the chat Green Building United's website. Um, if folks want to go and check um, check that out. And then I also post the link to uh, your podcast episode that you mentioned there. Thank you. Um, so if everybody um, goes and checks that out, sounds like there's a, a wealth of information out there um, with those to start. So what is wonderful about the Passive House community is that we're very open book. I hope this doesn't change, and I say this in my podcast um, as we get more mainstream. But basically, we we don't hide our trade secrets. We share our dirty laundry. We talk about what didn't work, what we would have done better, um, you know, what is working well, uh, and those best practices. And that community is much more like a scientific community than your typical. Um, uh, you know, AIA conference where everyone wants to show the pretty pictures and talk about all the successes, but you know, you're you're wondering, you know, where where were the stumbling blocks there? Um, and the Passive House community is about sharing that because we do hold that we understand we're working on a higher mission besides our own personal advancement, which is climate mitigation. So, um, so I think it's a very exciting, very wonderful community. It also has a larger percentage of women. Uh, in leadership and and then you will find in the, the regular community. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're an interesting group of people. And I think women are in there because a lot of women like myself started their own firm because, you know, they, they hit that glass ceiling and it didn't feel so good. <laughs> so we, we, we weren't being listened to. So we started our own firms and had the freedom to say, I'm, I'm going to explore this, right? I'm going to learn about that. So, um, so it's a great community. And uh, so join us. That sounds great. I would like to be uh, a, a building nerd as you, as you called it. That sounds fun. <laughs> um, let's see. So we have, yep. A few more questions still, uh, as long as you have a couple more minutes. Um, I know we're getting a little close to 1 PM, but um, 
So there's a question about the windows um, that it appears that they've been replaced um, and then why, why okay. was that necessary? I missed that. So that's one thing we did one with the Historic Commission, because these are triple pane, thermally insulated, tilt and turn. They tilt in and they open like a casement inward, all right? They are fixed at the top and they're offset. So they look, they're called simulated double hungs. They look like a double hum, but they, the bottom functions in a tilt and turn manner, right? They are passive house certified products, which means they have to pass an air tightness, they have multiple gaskets, they have to have um, a certain uh, warm uh, spacer, uh, and, and they are thermal insulated frames. The hardware on many of these products, particularly the ones that we are ordering from Europe and starting to be manufactured here, Wyeth Windows is in New Jersey, Zola is bringing a factory soon. Um, they make a, a lot of American windows look like toys. They are very robust, they will last a long time and they will save a lot of money. Their R value is typical to a typical wall, right? And yet they're the window and then the walls are double insulation. So, um, you know, what you get is no, no drafts. It's very comfortable. They're nearly soundproof in the city. It's wonderful and motorcycles go by, you know, you can listen to music without headphones. It's great. The other thing, our passive house, our building used to get mice every year, like an influx of mice, and we would battle them back most of the winter. We have no more vermin, why? Just like that um, infrared camera, the mice think we're just a rock. There's nothing to smell, there's no air leaks, it's thermally insulated, there's no warmth. They leave us alone and they go to the neighbors. That has been a wonderful luxury unexpected bonus a bonus for sure it sounds like can you repeat the name of i guess the window type again um just so i can write it in the chat it was a, a i know you mentioned simulated simulated double hung tilt and turn and we have um divided light um so uh it's passive house certified windows. There's a lot of them that come from all over the world. There are some that are North American now and, and, uh, and US factory built. Wyeth Windows is in New Jersey. Zola is a company from, uh, from I think Switzerland. Um, the ones that we have, Clearwall is an Irish window. That's our front windows that are the simulated double hungs with divided light, they're wood windows. Our rear windows are Intis, which are from Lithuania. Uh, if you do the carbon footprint of the shipping versus trucking, you'll find that it's no different carbon footprint. So, you know, so that's an interesting little calculation. But, um, you know, we do want more of these windows, more people who order them, you will get them. They do cost more, but they are so much more robust in uh, construction quality and in performance that um, it's really great. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm trying to just make sure that I haven't missed anything here. Um, all right, so let's do one more question here. I know we're a couple minutes past I'm happy one. to go over if there's more questions. Okay, great. <laughs> so um, let's see, have products like, so I know you mentioned cork, um, but then hydraulic lime and diatomaceous earth been considered uh, for use. So in the basement, when we parge the wall, we use hydrated lime um, plaster. So uh, you have to check the moisture. Uh, you know, there's different levels of it. I think ours was five. Um, and when the 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 basement folks ran out, they actually used another bag of something. And of course, about a month later, it fell off the wall. <laughs> so moisture does come through that wall quite a bit. So the hydrated lime allows it to sweat, and it draps down behind our, our, um, our moisture barrier that we attached to the wall and goes into our perimeter drain. So, um, but yes, hydrated lime plaster is appropriate. Now on interior walls, particularly um, on a party wall, you can just use a brown coat plaster that will seal it just fine and be less expensive. There's, you know, so again, Every wall has a different dynamic that it's dealing with. And, and so different products are appropriate to different places uh, and they have different price points. So a hydrated line plaster is 
much more expensive than brown coat. So, you know, you want to use it in the right places for cost effectiveness. Understood. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So let's do one more. So um, I think, I guess if you could speak a little bit more to um, replacement windows versus uh, retaining the existing windows um, and how, you know, I guess that affects energy efficiently energy efficiency, I think maybe the question is, you know, there, we should sort of try to um, keep the existing windows if possible, but can you tell us a little bit more about how um, replacing them might affect the energy okay. efficiency? So when we put these windows in, we have joist pockets, which are big, leaky, uninsulated areas in your walls around your windows, right? So there's no way you're going to be energy efficient with those windows, unfortunately. So um, we actually used those joist pockets to insulate. It allowed us to, you know, cause the, the frames of these windows are a little thicker or a little wider, but when we use the joist pocket, we were able to cover that with, with the frame and thus it, the appearance was much more like the original windows. Of course, you can't get old growth uh, windows very much anymore, which could be thinner because the wood was was very good and we don't have that hardly anymore. So, um, but you need to air seal around that window. It's as important as the window being airtight. If it isn't in an airtight pocket and that continuous air barrier, you have to be able to connect the dots, right? It has to be continuous, right? That's very hard and probably near impossible to do with existing windows. Um, uh, and with uh, retrofit replacement windows, you have a similar thing because you're using that same frame. So we took it back to the brick mold. Um, uh, I mean, you might be able to do an analysis and figure out a way to do it, but I think it would be very tricky. Okay. And um, I guess follow up to that. Um, if is the window manufacturer info also included on those slides with the other product info? I believe so. Okay. Yes. Great. So we can share that. Um, so the and, question is, you know, is if if you just um, you know Google passive house certified products or go on the U.S. passive house website, I believe they have links to some of those products um, because they they manage the certification. Understood. Okay, great. That's great. Yeah, because I think so. It sounds like, you know, of course, I think from the preservation side, um, you know, we're kind of looking to encourage saving existing windows if possible. But I guess, do these types of replacement windows um, sort of do they look the same in, in appearance? Do they typically fit within, um, you know, sort of preservation guidelines or, or ordinances in your experience? This is the win that we didn't have to go to, to, to an appeal with, you know, we had to appeal for the rear. But the Historic Commission in Philadelphia, which is a pretty serious commission, I must say, um, they approved these simulated double hungs. So I think that speaks for itself. That that was not that happened in the first round. We didn't have to convince them of that. They 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 saw the value of that and the appropriateness of it, and they accepted it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Laura. Um, I think, yeah, we're 107 now, so I do want to let people get back to their day, but um, I just want to thank you so much again. That was really interesting. We had tons of questions, and, and it sounds like everybody was really eager to, to learn, um, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I did want to let everybody know, while we still have some folks to save the dates for our upcoming webinars, um, so look out for more information on that. Uh, you can go to PDI's website or our Facebook page. Um, I've also posted a link in the chat to our YouTube channel. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we are recording this. So we'll post uh, the recording of this presentation on our YouTube channel. We'll also share the links um, that Laura mentioned to all of the different products uh, that she talked about today. Um, and uh, there will be a survey after the webinar. So if you have a few minutes to take that, we would appreciate it. Um, but with that, Laura, thank you so much again. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I hope everybody, uh, everybody enjoyed the webinar today. Thank you. It's been an honor. <laughs>